Well, hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining me on the Facebook page, Integral Global. And thank you to Corey DeVos and Rob Smith and all the fine folks at Integral Life for hosting me here and on YouTube and on the iLife station and all that good stuff. That's really, really nice to be with you. So I think I'd, I'll start today with uh, just uh, the laugh of the week for me. <laughs> you know, there's so many of these memes going around and friends forward them and stuff. And I got to say, this is my favorite one. This is a, a meme or a joke from The Onion. And uh, I always love The Onion. And he's saying, sometimes it feels like you're the only one who understands me, whispers Trump to White House roach infestation. Pretty funny, huh? And then it goes on in a little article. It says, things are so tough right now. And it's nice to know someone out there has so much in common with me, really gets what I'm feeling, said Trump to the skittering mass of insects that coated the walls, furniture, and floors of the Oval Office and feasted on rotting hamburger in a waste paper basket. That made me laugh. All right. So let's get into the meat of things. I got a good bit to cover here today, and I'm eager to get into it. But before I get into some of the actual meat of the news of the week, if you will, it occurs to me, being on this new platform of Integral Global, that some of you may not know me. Uh, and so I'll do a quick introduction of me and how I approach Integral and what I'm doing here. And uh, I'll make it quick. So I've been an Integral nut since the mid 80s when I walked into a bookstore and saw a book titled Up From Eden by Ken Wilber. And as a lonely seeker, Up From Eden hit me right between the eyes. Oh, Up From Eden, we're evolving up from the swamps. And um, that changed everything for me. So I was a lonely integralist for a couple decades and then began working with Ken Wilber, who lived five miles from me, and I had no idea all those years, uh, and, uh, and the gang at the Integral Institute. That was 2003, and we started the Integral Institute seminars, and we did, I don't know how many, 50, 60-plus seminars on all sorts of things, on integral psychotherapy, business, integral life practice, you name it, because integral covers everything, right? And so we did that. And then in 2007, I started the Boulder Integral Center here, a real brick, bricks and mortar center for integral practice. And we did programs where people came from all over the place. And that's gone for 15, 14 years. Uh, Robert McNaughton took over about halfway through and it did a last close last year. Uh, and, um, but uh, what a run. I have been doing this podcast now for I don't know, I think eight or 10 years, I have 268 episodes, they tell me, on my site, dailyevolver.com. And you can find all of that, plus, you know, how to connect with me. Uh, there's a connect button. There's a theory button where it's basic theory. If you want to turn people on to this or get a little refresher yourself, dailyevolver.com. And so what I do here is... I look at current events through the lens of integral theory, and I am inspired, my root teacher, as they say, in a, in a spiritual tradition. In traditions, they talk about your root teacher being the person who blew you open to the capital T teachings, and that's the first one who do, does that is your root teacher, and my root teacher is Ken Wilber, as it is for many of us who are listening to this. and. Um, his books are a treasure and have been a mind blow to me. They're, they're psychoactive, as he often says. And in more recent years, and probably a decade now, I've been quite inspired by the work of Steve McIntosh. And I have him on the show quite a bit, and we've got some good stuff planned for the future. And he brings his own, you know, indigenous view of integral to the party and um, I recommend it. Uh, his latest book is called Developmental Politics. And I, I, I saw what 
Jason Lang, my uh, old buddy, had pinned to the top of his Twitter after the election is still there. And it's identity politics, goodbye identity politics, hello developmental politics. And he links to Steve's book. And I like that. I think we're on the cusp of something new. And, um, you know, many voices are speaking. I've been inspired by so many people. But that's where I'm coming from, is these two guys are my two big teachers, if you will. Now, the integral that I bring to the party, I'll just say that, you know, my, my emphasis uh, is on the idea of consciousness and cultural evolution, that human beings evolve, uh, we haven't just evolved biologically, but consciousness, which is actually from the first moments of the Big Bang, you know, that, that subatomic particles have consciousness that their own little tiny consciousnesses and little tiny relationships with each other, where there's little tiny choices that they make. And of course they exist in third person in material space as we do. But that consciousness evolves in terms of the individual human being that we can see stages of consciousness, Piaget and so forth as people develop, individuals, children mainly, but there's adult development as well. And also, um, Humanity has evolved through time as a sort of a center of gravity of the collective through various st stages that are well mapped out. And I'll just uh, go to a quick chart. Again, this is just a quick re remedial. These stages of development, uh, starting with just dawning self-awareness and moving up through an enchanted tribal world of what we call magenta or in spiral dynamics, purple. Then a warrior stage, which is egocentric, uh, aggressive, uh, vigilant, ruthless, courageous, powerful. And then a great civilization of these red impulses into um, traditional cultures, which value rules, roles, and discipline and have faith in a transcendent God. Vengeance is no longer mine, it is God's. And um, so I can let all of that relax. And that's very much online still in the world, as is red, as is magenta, actually. And then we have orange rationality, uh, science, individualism, all of that good stuff. And then green, sensitivity, egalitarianism, pluralism, relativistics, um, and, and that as um, integralists, we want to appreciate all of them and have an integration of the best of all of them. And to see that each of them has an upside and a downside, I've talked about this endlessly on the show, and that our job as integralists, which is the stage that is emerging out of green sensitive postmodern stage, is the one that is friendly to all of them, and captured by none, it is the new leading edge of, the, of consciousness, both in individuals, many individuals are there and beyond, and in centers of gravities of the culture. And there's an emerging edge of integralists, whether or not they know it, uh, that maybe three, four, 5% of the culture in, developed, uh, in the developed world, maybe 25, 30% are green, postmodern, another 25% orange, 30% maybe, and then the rest are traditional social conservatives and then, you know, more uh, mythic and magical. So um, that's the basic sort of landscape of, of the culture. So our job as integral practitioners is to consciously integrate these things and move into this new way of thinking. And one of the ways that we can describe this new way of integral thinking is that it is multi-perspectival. That is, it takes the perspectives of other people very easily in other stages. Claire Graves, one of the original developmental psychologists that laid all of this out, talked about integral as being the stage that is the universal donor. And so that is a good thing. But it's interesting because I'm in a group of people, integral practitioners, who talk about this sort of thing. And so, you know, one of the projects of integrals to 
differentiate good from bad in these earlier stages and, you know, tease them apart and integrate the good and all that good stuff. So it would follow then. So what's the downside of integral? And that has been uh, a question that we have, and there's been various answers, but one of them, and you'll hear integralists and integral theory being critiqued for this, is that it's too heady. It's too much thinking because there's, there's two stages of integral, uh, teal and turquoise, the first one, or, or yellow and turquoise if you're using spiral dynamics, but it's sort of entry integral and then mature integral. And, and the, the first one, teal slash yellow, what it gets, first of all, it gets evolution. It gets that one thing evolves out of the next and by including and transcending, by differentiating and integrating. And there's these various sort of engines of evolution that are at work and, and integral begins to see that. And as a result, they see systems of systems and how everything fits together in a new way. I mean, everything's included, it's so great. And that can seem heady because you know all of a sudden lots more clear to you than there was before. And I, I saw that it, it's interesting to just see in, in real life how these things manifest. And so I was reading, I guess, yes, Sunday in the New York Times about uh, a review of Obama's new book. And it's titled, Obama Thinks, and in parentheses, and thinks some more, in parentheses, about his first term. And um, it's written by Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Slazy. And, um, and it's, it's, it's interesting how she critiques him. First of all, the, the headline itself, Obama thinks and thinks some more about his first term. So that theme of him being too heady is, is put forth in this review. And then the second critique that I thought was interesting is the critique of multi-perspectivalism itself. And, um, and people who aren't multi-perspectival, and, and by the way, I don't mean to say that integralists move into this, all of a sudden you're multi-perspectival, you know, we have, we're waist deep or neck deep in first tier memes, all of us, but we're getting it. You know, we get that you know, finding somebody to be an enemy is not as interesting as it used to be. And you want to actually find out what they think. And so, you know, people like that. <laughs> people like it when you're sympathetic to their view uh, and you can see it and you see what they're talking about and where they're coming from. But they don't like it when you can't say when you say the same thing about their enemies and you can see their point of view too so it's a little bit of a no-win situation get accused of birth, uh, both sidesism and uh you know and i am actually a committed both sidesist i gotta say but anyway here's what she said about obama that sort of gets to this second piece she says in the book Obama demonstrates an almost compulsive tendency to imagine himself into the lives of others, parentheses, whether it's Hillary Clinton, John McCain, or in one passage, a Somali pirate. That's what I love about Obama. You know, he um, has that tendency, <laughs> but you got to watch it. I mean, that's sort of the tone of the article here, you know. And, um, and you, you get that as an integralist, you know, you have the tendency to imagine yourself into the lives of others. It's almost compulsive with you and you should be careful of that. So, um, but again, that's what I love about Obama and um, I can't wait to get the book. So anyway, so that's sort of that in, entry level integral, if you will, yellow, teal, whatever you want to call it in terms of the color. Uh, but it is, uh, but the, then the second stage of integral is that where you've taken enough perspectives and you have to the, to the point where there's this new sort of expansion of identity where there's a larger space of who you are within which all these perspectives are arising. And you may have a favorite and you may have the one you had as a kid and you may see all of these, but you see them not be them. 
And so what's cool about that is that they're all available to you. And there's a certain wisdom that comes online that causes the one that is most appropriate to show up. And that's where it starts getting a little bit spooky. And that's second stage integral, which both systems call turquoise. It's sort of the realization that the space of awareness of I and of identity is itself alive. It sees and loves the creation and every piece of it, including me. And it has a life of itself. And, um, and that's where it gets kind of spiritual. And not all integralists are interested in that or go there. But that's the theory. And that has been, I think, uh, for me, totally, absolutely true, and very, very helpful to know. I always think of, um, you know, art is a way of getting to this, because words fail at some point with these realizations. And uh, I've, I've used this quick verse before, but it just so nails this realization, this turquoise realization. And it's um, from Song of Myself by uh, Walt Whitman. And I'll just do a few lines. He says, urge and urge and urge. Always the procreate urge of the world. Out of the dimness, opposite equals advance always substance and increase, always sex, always a knit of identity, always distinction, always the breed of life. And I just think that is the realization, that's a turquoise realization there, that it's happening under its own power and we're part of it and we should be and it matters. All right, so now let's turn some of these insights to what's arising in our current world situation. And, uh, and to do that, I wanna play some segments from Sunday's show of Fareed Zakaria GPS Public Square, because I think there was some you know, good tensions and good things that were uh, illuminated on the show that are have an integral, uh, the integral can explain better than anything else is basically, because it includes everything. So he's talking, of course, about what's going on with Trump attacking, defaming, delegitimizing the U.S. election, and, and as he puts it, in manner unprecedented in the country's history. What a drag it is, which it is. And I've talked endlessly about Trump. You can find out more what I think in past episodes, but let's just stick with what Fareed has to say, and we'll unpack some of this. His obstructionism won't keep him in power, but it will deeply wound America's democratic culture. He is whipping his base into a frenzy about a stolen election, and few of them are going to change their minds because of court decisions and recounts. The conspiracy theory of the stolen election of 2020 is here to stay. So, yeah. So then he goes on to talk about how this idea that we did it to Trump, the left, uh, which I still identify with, um, and, and didn't accept his victory. He points out that no, Hillary conceded that night. She did a speech in support. Obama met with him the next day, spent time with him, and the transition um, proceeded. So he talks about that. I can't play too much of it because the uh, has copyrights and I never know what I'm doing with all that. So um, I'm just going to do pieces here. I think it'll work. So then Fareed goes into a, um, an explanation of the dangers of this. And he talks about some dark parallels from history. The historical parallel that seems most appropriate today is a very dark one. After Germany surrendered at the end of World War I, ultra right-wing groups concocted the myth that Germany was actually on the verge of winning the war in November 1918, but surrendered because of a conspiracy to destroy the country plotted by certain communists and Jews. Hitler often raised the topic during his rise to power. In a 1922 speech, he said, we must call to account the November criminals of 1918. It cannot be that two million Germans should have fallen in vain and afterwards one should sit down as friends at the same table with traitors. 
No, we do not pardon. We demand vengeance. Fareed's talking about there is um, actually a stage in human development. We, we talk about the Trump era. There was a lot of talk about this, at the, particularly at the beginning of his term, about him being post-truth in the, and uh, that the, the society had moved to a post-truth um, world. Uh, and, and that there's, I, I, I like that thesis, it, it makes a lot of sense. But if we look at Trump himself and the kind of parallels that Fareed's talking about in Germany and actually throughout human history, if you will, preceding that, it's actually pre-truth. You know, truth as we understand it, small t truth, that is accuracy, uh, analysis, logic, statistics, all of that comes online really in orange modernity. That literally doesn't exist in, you know, these truly traditional and pre-traditional societies, these red societies. They prefer capital T truth, which is the great story, the great myth, and, and the great God, and the great person, and the person to be loyal to, and to the degree that, you know, you're in danger, in, in red particularly, the person to get behind, the strongest person. And that person didn't govern, they ruled. They don't try to persuade, they assert. And you know, you get that feeling of, yeah, Trump, absolutely. And because there's no real or adjudicating function in terms of truth and laws, uh, it's conspiracies and religious law, uh, which is if you want, you know, bring in an expert, you bring in a priest or an astrologer, or a soothsayer. You know, you cut open the stomach of a goat and see what the entrails tell you. And that's the big category of humanity uh, before rationality. And it's also the world of a child, I must say, uh, before, you know, you get too scientific, maybe in junior high, and some people never get there. I mean, not in their hearts. And that's part of, you know, as integralists, we see that. And um, so then let me just play this last part. But his actions today will have a large and lasting effect on this country's politics and culture for decades, creating a cancer that will metastasize in gruesome ways. So uh, large and lasting effects uh, that will create a cancer that will metastasize in gruesome ways. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, it, it, it is absolutely important to see the power of the pre-rational. And we have all gotten a masterclass in it in the last four years with this autocratic, pre-rational, egotistic, damaged in many ways that I've talked about, man, Trump, who, yes, will use and ignore the norms of history or the norms of a society as needed to, uh, you know, further his rise to glory. And that's, that's, that's not just Hitler or Trump or, you know, any autocrat that we know of or in recent history. That's all of human history. And um, so I, I just want to make that point because... Yes, we could see that this is a sort of fixed pole of these are these earlier stages. These are still online where great myths have a lot of juice to them. They're very deeply comforting in ways that modern people are allergic to. And magic and how things work, uh, that's a actual dimension of reality that orange marginalizes. And people who live in that state sort of, you know, pre-orange world, really deeply resent it, don't get it, feel confused by it, uh, and want to fight against it. And so that is what we're seeing. And these people will be uh, lit up and have been lit up by Trump. But, uh, but there's more to the story. And so uh, the, the theme of Fareed's show, and I'm going to play another couple excerpts, is he had on all people who were high-level Republicans in previous administrations to talk about Trump and what's going on. And so he had H.R. McMaster, 
who was, I forget what, I mean, he was actually in the Trump administration. He's a, a, a general in the uh, armed forces and, um, you know, a high profile guy here. And he just wrote a new book called Battlegrounds. And so he's on Fareed and Fareed asks him what he thinks of Trump. And uh, he kind of goes in a little bit of a different and surprising direction. So here's H.R. McMaster. Hey, first of all, I mean, that was pretty depressing lead in Fareed. I'll tell you, I think I'm a lot more optimistic than you are. You know, what I write about in, in Battlegrounds is that the only thing worse than the than the ignorance of history is the misuse of it. And I'll tell you, Fareed, you know, we just did, haven't we just didn't uh, go through World War One and we're not the Weimar Republic. So I, I just think that we have to be more confident, recognize that our founders, they did a brilliant job, Fareed. You know, they thought about hey, what could go wrong? And and they designed a system that could compensate for the worst case scenario. A president that's acting irresponsibly like President Trump is, well, guess what? Our, our, our founders set it up so that the executive branch doesn't even have a say in the transition. So, I, Fried, I think we should be a lot more confident. Yeah, so <laughs> I got to say, Fareed rolled with that pretty well. He said, uh, that was kind of a harsh criticism that the one thing worse than the ignorance of history is the misuse of it. But we see it a lot uh, in just the way Fareed did it. And that is, you know, this is the beauty of integral and in evolution is that we've evolved since Nazis and the Nazis were not that different from the Romans. Uh, at least they didn't have, you know, public torture of animals and Christians. Uh, you know, it's it's the human history, Jesus, Lord. I mean, no wonder we're depressed. But anyway, <laughs> I'm glad that H.R. McMaster called it out as what a depressing lead in. Because what Integral shows us is that we evolve, and this is, you know, not just um, evolutionary or stage theory, this is quadrant theory, or, um, and which those of you who know Ken's aqua model understand is that we evolve in first person, second person, and third person through all of these stages that I pointed out, and not always at the same time in, or in the same way. And we evolved in very many lines of development in very um, unequal ways. But first, second, and third person is a really nice sort of the three big categories. And the Nazis were pre-modern in both first person, which is that they were provincial, they were felt desperate, they were um, not willing to be serfs, they were, you know, that's a lot of the impulse around the first person of pre-modern people is that, you know, they get that the world is big mess of people oppressing and being oppressed, and they want out of that, they want to be the oppressor, actually, I mean, that's the way forward, it's really depressing again, but that's most of human history. So first person, uh, that's how you think, literally how you see the world. In second person, it's relation. So it's relationship. And again, domination, submission, a very much family oriented, racially oriented. And this is um, true also of the people who are at that stage of development now. And that's the big difference is that in Weimar, Germany, 80 plus percent of the people were susceptible to that kind of thinking because that's where they were. Uh, the world has turned so much, uh, largely because of what happened in World War II, as it was a big lesson for people, for humanity. Uh, we have in developed world, America's probably a little lagging, uh, but maybe, you know, 80%, I mean, sorry, 30% of the people live in that world where it's, you know, basically their hearts are pre-modern. And so the problem, of course, for Nazism is there's a great sour spot in history where pre-modern mentality, but modern in the third person. So modern weaponry and logistics and machines and industrialization and basically the, the industrialization of genocide. Genocide was nothing new. Um, in fact, if you didn't kill your enemy and wipe them out, you were not being responsible if you were at red. Um, so that, it's a sour spot in history. And we've moved beyond that in the developed world. There's certain countries 
where you know every country basically now has modern technology if they want it or they want to buy it or have it given to them by uh, a m- more modern country. But the interiors, their individual consciousness, their cultures uh, can be um, not there yet. And they're dangerous, just like the Nazis were. And, you know, one of the, um, it's like McMaster said, is that the founders were of America were, this was not news to them. They were explicitly trying to create a government where autocrats and demagogues would not prevail. And so they did something that was unheard of in human history that, that actually took, and that is a real separation of powers. And um, so we have the, 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 you know, the Congress and president and the, and the courts and all of that good stuff. And I think we can count on that. And I, I, we're going to be tested here in the next couple months by this autocrat, you know, uh, and um, I got a, a wonderful message from one of my listeners in Venezuela, and it actually uh, uh, broke off after about a minute and a half, but she was talking about, hey, you Americans, pay attention to your founders. They did a great job. And, you know, I think that's true. You know, the question to me is, are we, um, is Trump, what's good faith mean, you know, in this sort of, view of things. To me, the, the, the central question of Trump is, is he operating from a sort of red good faith? I mean, does he really believe that Obama was born in Kenya? Does he really believe that there were systemic um, fraud in this election? Did he really believe that when Ted Cruz beat him in Iowa and he accused, accused Ted Cruz of um, cheating back during the primaries? Or is he cynically using it with people who are not cynical, but actually are indeed, their hearts are there and their hearts are with them. And uh, that was actually another guest that was on Fareed's show. I probably should have kept it, but it was um, Peggy Noonan, who, you know, she's a grand dame of conventional mainstream Republicanism. And she talked about how angry she was that these people who were also the base of Reagan, which is her guy, that's she was speechwriter for Reagan, how these are good people and they don't deserve to be um, manipulated like this. And, uh, you know, how manipulated are they? I'm, I don't know. I'm, I, I get stalled here when I try to think it through. I mean, we've, we had the nature versus nurture argument about what makes us who we are as, you know, mature people? Was it how our parents raised it or is it genetics? And the consensus now is it's both. And, and I, I like that, of course, as an integralist, I'm always after the both answer. Trump is a lying hypocrite and also lives in that world of conspiracies where they arise under their own power and make sense immediately because uh, you're fighting for your world against this, what I've often referred to as mean orange and mean green, this globalist multiculturalist thing that wants to come in and erase you basically. And people see it that way. There was, in fact, I think I could find it here, um, a quote from, uh, it's about, it's from this book, The Death of Democracy, which he was quoting, Freed was quoting from, by uh, Benjamin Carter Hett, and it's about how the Germans became Nazified. The trauma of defeat left millions of Germans believing a particular narrative about the war, not because it was demonstrably true, but because it was emotionally necessary. You know, it's something like that with red, uh, blue America as well. And I'm not using the, the red and blue in the typical ways, but the the, the, the warrior and traditionalists, the God and country people, the real social conservatives, the Trump lovers, the 30% who love them. They don't just vote for them for economic reasons for, or for rational reasons, which you can do with Trump if you want, uh, but because they love him because he's fighting for their world and their worldview. They're living in a world, I mean, it's, again, I, I don't want to overstate the parallels to post-World War I Germany, but they look around and see that their world has been trashed 
and that they don't matter anymore. They're mad about it. And we thought we were going to move on without them. And it turns out we're not. So I've talked about that uh, quite a bit over many episodes. Um, but I think I'll end there. I've got some other really interesting stuff, but I'll just play it next week. That's a great thing about doing this once a week, uh, 1 p.m. Mountain Time on Integral Life Live Portal. And uh, if you haven't already, please consider becoming a member of Integral Life. They are the main portal for Ken Wilbur, first of all, and for the sort of core of the integral world in general. And they sponsor this Facebook page, uh, Integral Global. And um, yeah, so I hope you do that and uh, check in with me again the week from today, uh, the week before, the day before Thanksgiving. See my stuff at dailyevolver.com, like me on Facebook, all that good stuff. All right, I think we'll end it there and I hope you have a great day and see you next time.